And welcome inside the Podcasters Row. This is Kika Podcast, thanking and welcoming you to another program and appreciating all of you that realize that maybe it's not the easiest to go ahead and grab guests that are just so willing and amiable and just motivated to go and do another podcast to talk about their podcast. I don't know why that is, but like, if you're interested in having your own podcast featured here on the program, then please reach out to me, kingofpodcasts.com, and we'll do that. But nevertheless, when I do put the word out, the message and I do get some wonderful people on here. I mean, so far, this next group of people we've had on the program have been wonderful. Today, let's go and continue on with that. So I'm talking right now with a host who hosts a podcast for veterinary professionals and those interested in pursuing a career in veterinary medicine. And the show is called Vet Life Reimagine. And I'm here with Dr. Megan Sprinkle. Dr. Megan, thanks for being on with us. Thank you for having me. I'm looking forward to it. So my background when it comes to production for podcasting, because besides what I do here independently, I manage a digital media company, it's a mom and pop organization, but we have two podcast networks. And for a year and a half, I did host, a, uh, I and I did do a lot of production for a program called it's, Do- it's a Dog's Life. And it is from a veterinarian. Uh, she wasn't a veterinarian herself. I, I forget what exactly what her back, I don't think she was a DVM, but she did have on veterinarians on because what she did was she provided CBD products. Okay. And the idea is that, you know, nevertheless, it was still about, and then we had someone else that did another show because we had that show go on with two different hosts, but it gave me a whole lot of access just to hear. And it's just only was dogs, but not even going into the gamut of just, you know, going into all livestock or just basically just all pets in general. And were there a lot of, podcasts out there that really did go towards the professionals, those that were going to be that wanted to be veterinarians. Was there a a calling for that? What made you make the call to go ahead and put the show together? Because there's a lot of pet shows out there, but I don't see a lot for vets. Yeah. So I am in a niche uh, with an audience of of specifically the veterinary professionals or those interested in getting into veterinary medicine. It is definitely a niche that I have. (laughs) Um, I'm discovering more and more. So I started Vet Life Reimagined when I was sitting in an industry role. So I'm a very unique veterinarian. My career path is very non-traditional. I am not a veterinarian that sits in a clinic. So I myself is a very very curious from an early age. I could see the possibilities within veterinary medicine. And so that's where I I found myself in in kind of a unique position. I worked for a pet food company because I specialized in nutrition. And I found, especially during COVID, because COVID, I'm sure everybody has their COVID story (laughs) when a project started, but we are, the veterinary community is kind of known for the high rates of burnout, compassion fatigue, and honestly, even suicide. So that was already there. Now we add a pandemic on top of it where we can't interact with clients. Everything is drop off. The caseload is extremely heavy. You're having to deal with smaller number of staff as well. And so the burnout rates just went through the roof. Right. And then people looked on LinkedIn and they saw me with a different type of role as a veterinarian and they would reach out and want to talk and see what other possibilities were in the profession. And I even got that from people within industry. And I just realized that I saw the vast potential in this career that not a lot of people did. And so that was the start of the podcast was to really show people all the different things you can do in veterinary medicine. And so if you think about it, people without veterinary backgrounds have no idea. And it really wasn't that much better within the profession. So that's it. It's an interview style podcast that gets to interview veterinarians, uh, veterinary technicians, even practice managers, and really showing the diversity of things that you can do in this industry. So it's a lot of fun. So it's one of those things to fill the niche and put a very specific podcast out there. But that's really the benefit of podcasting is because you can reach that exact audience and it's not a small audience. I'm sure of that because there's a lot of veterinarians, obviously, that could really use the benefit of being able to go and hear from other like-minded veterinarians and find other treatments or procedures or, you know, the normalities that they use right now. And then also because 
<clears throat> for yourself, you also have the experience and you have, you know, a, a lot of criteria that really qualifies you to go ahead and host the program. Going back and looking at what you've done, you know, you received your veterinary degree from Auburn University. You also did a residency on new small animal clinical nutrition at University of Missouri. And at that time, you were focusing on the vitamin D metabolites research in cats. And then you've also served for the American Academy for Veterinary Medicine. There's a lot that you've put into yourself, a lot of passion behind your role. So with that said, when you're hosting these shows, how much do you feel like is the ratio of how much you want to hear from your guests and how much time you actually put your own input into what the conversation is? Because I always think when every time I ever have somebody that I'm producing a podcast for, and I know their expertise matches or supersedes the guest you're on with, then I always say, put your input in there, make sure you're, you're equal time in the interview. So what would you say about that? That's, I mean, I'm always open for feedback, but I do try to really highlight my guest and, but that doesn't mean that I don't have input because I mm -hmm. do also like the conversational style. I think that's why I do like interview podcasts. But I, I really do try to spotlight them. And a big part of my style is I allow the guests to really share their personal story. So it's more of a storytelling podcast. You get to hear their adventures of going through and why they made certain decisions. Because that's really what I want my guests to also see is what are the values that my guests are talking about, their personal values that help them make decisions. Because once they can see them do that and think in that way, then they themselves can do that for themselves. So it's not about putting your identity on a title. It's about understanding your values. And then once you do that, it's a lot easier to decide, oh, okay, this fits my values. So I really want to make sure that the guest has that opportunity to share that part of their story. And then, of course, we also talk about whatever they are particularly passionate about. So if it is, if they are really big, I, one of my top podcasts is about stem cells. So she talked about her career in leading this company uh, with stem cells. So we also get to talk a lot about that. And I will be honest, I am not an expert in stem cells. So, so she needs the floor on that one. <laughs> oh, no, exactly. <laughs> but it is one of those where, and I totally agree with what you're saying right there, because it is where if you're, if it's, over your head and it's like well you have an understanding but you're just look, looking to just go ahead and learn more and just absorb it in absolutely then that person gets the floor to know that about it so you've done over 100 episodes so far to date and consistently every week so with that said you also the audience you reach out to is not just those that are professionally now in the world of being you know doctors of veterinary medicine but those that are aspiring now when you put the shows together what is it about how are you able to go ahead and target those that are looking to get into veterinary medicine and keeping the audience where, okay, it might be advanced on some shows and some shows it might be a little bit more entry level. Yeah. I, so I will admit that that is the audience that's a little bit harder because it's also the younger generation. Right. Now, good news. I just heard the stats that the, audience, the population that is starting to listen to more podcasts is getting younger. Oh, yeah. So it's like, yay, we're going in the right direction there for me because I, I kind of do have a, a range when it comes to age. And I don't think it is too soon to understand all the different things that you can do in this profession. And it was so interesting. I, I'm supporting my boss right now. And we're about to go speak at a women in tech conference. And I was listening to the founder of this organization. And she said the same thing, that she really wants to let women and young girls know there's a lot more to technology than coding, right? right. Same thing in veterinary medicine there. I mean, as much as we need veterinarians in clinic and there's that's perfectly fine. I've interviewed plenty of people in, in clinic, but they do lots of different things as well. And so I think it's good to make sure that when they go into school, whether it's even undergrad or getting into vet school, that they keep that open mind. Because I think when you have that curious mind, open mind, you're more able to receive things and you don't put blinders on and just get stuck on a path. And then when you get down that path all the way, and then you realize, oh, I may not like this. You know, I, I want to make sure that they know that's okay. And then they can try different things. So yeah, I don't think that you can be too young. I would imagine that 
the direct the path that someone that would want to be a veterinarian would be that they were already a pet owner or they had a pet in their home for a long time and just the closest the attachment compassionate caregiving is part of that but there are also quite a few uh, a lot of young people especially a lot of women that will go into the areas of either nurse practitioner nursing you know go into medicine in other ways but just more human side but do you see that there's enough qualified students that are coming into the space to continue to have like you said there was quite of a fallout from the pandemic from veterinarians that got burned out is there enough you know young veterinarians or that are going to be coming into the space to fulfill all these different animal hospitals all these different clinics is there enough of a pool out there that there's still a lot of great interest in veterinary medicine Yes, it is. Uh, <laughs> we attract very passionate people. And this is actually something that we need to work on too, is that despite us trying to spread the awareness of the challenges of veterinary medicine, we've actually seen where people just come in and assume they're going to burn out. And instead of trying to work on the things that will help prevent <laughs> the burnout and make them more resilient, and, and understand, yes, it's it's still going to be a hard job, but these are the things to take care of yourself. These are the things to be out watching out for so that you can take care of yourself and, and try to avoid burnout and compassion fatigue, like getting a really good solid team around you that's very supportive, being able to talk to people. I think all of those things. Um, we absolutely do have lots of people interested. It's actually harder to get into veterinary school than medical school, mainly because we don't have as many veterinary schools, and so right. there's not as many seats. But they are have been opening new veterinary schools quite rapidly for building universities over the past couple of years to try to account for a potential shortage that we have. And mainly, it's not necessarily. We do have people who are either leaving clinic or even leaving the profession entirely, but we have work on making sure that we address the shortage on both sides, both the retention aspect of things, but also more people into the pool as well, which I think is the smart way of doing it. If you only focused on the part of putting them into the pool, but you're not taking care of the people, you're just going to have a leaky bucket and they're going to keep falling out. So we have to kind of address both sides of that. And again, that's something that I, I hope even the podcast understanding where you need to put your identity and your personal values, the options that are out there, both inside and outside of clinic, will help contribute to that as well. Now, are there any particular animals that you focus on more than others? Is it more just domesticated to dogs and cats? Do you include more horses, reptiles, or other mammals, other species? Like what? I mean, how I guess how far the spectrum have you gone in terms of what kind of pets to talk about? Well, m me personally, I've done quite a bit. <laughs> I actually started with marine mammals and zoo. So oh, wow. I have experienced a lot of different species. So I'm very passionate about this as well, even though I focus more on cats and dogs since my residency. But for the people that come on the podcast, I do admit that it is heavily on the cat dog side. However, I have had both like uh, equine a focus, so horses. We've got some large animal uh like small ruminants, that's like your sheeps and your goats. Um, I have had zoo veterinarians, a marine mammal veterinarian. So you kind of have to think of the population. There's a very tiny population of marine mammal veterinarians <laughs> and a lot bigger population of, of cat dog kind of veterinarians. Mm -hmm. So it, it's kind of an equal representation on the podcast. So heavily that direction. But if you're looking for exotic animals as well, um, yes, we've got some on there that are represented. One of the things I also dealt with a lot when we were producing the this dog it's a dog's life program was mm -hmm. nutrition. And I know that for yourself that you are a board certified veterinary nutritionist. So when it comes to animals and, and doing again what you did as residency on animal clinical nutrition, one of the areas we always heard about so much on the other show was, you know, don't go after those big process, big big corporate, you know, cat foods, dog foods find more organic, find more that's just with with very little that's being done. So it's just a very natural organic product that the, that the pets are, you know, enjoying every day. So when you look at that, how much, how often does that come into play where you go ahead and talk about the nutrition and, 
you know, do you feel like you get on the bully pulpit sometimes and you have to go ahead and, you know, kind of lecture people, don't give these pets this kind of, these kind of uh, foods because of what, the, what's inside of them, all the different chemicals and different things are going to be put inside. I, of course, could have a whole podcast just on pet nutrition. Oh, <laughs> it would a lone, standalone series, absolutely. Blow, blow people's minds, I'm sure, because <laughs> I have experienced it from every aspect of the mm-hmm. clinical perspective as well as an in industry. So I, I have a very open-minded uh, approach that, to that. Uh, however, yes, there are going to be a couple of times when I, I hype up a nutrition example mm-hmm. just to relate to the guest because there are a lot of parallels Nutrition is a really challenging specialty because of all the things that you could specialize in veterinary medicine, it is the most emotional and opinionated (laughs) and diversely opinionated specialty that you could get into. And so if you think about it, as you probably know, working with that podcast, it is very central to the health of the pet because what's the one thing that we do with our pets every single day. Yeah. At least I hope so. You feed them. <laughs> and and so people are are that's gonna be an activity that they do with their pet. Uh they are gonna that's the one thing I can control. So it's something that they're gonna have an opinion on. And we also live in a time where people love to research things. So you can find every single opinion out there right. on how to feed your pet. So luckily, actually, I've only had one nutritionist on the podcast other than myself. Oh, wow. So it's not a heavily nutrition (laughs) podcast. It really is focused more on, you know, different career paths, the innovation, what's going on in the veterinary industry to be mindful of those kinds of topics. I'm very big on innovation as well. So I love bringing on people who are in the innovation and entrepreneurship Mm -hmm. side of our, our industry. Um, so other than, you know, a couple examples, cause I, I can't help myself. Um, there's not, a, there's not preaching on there. Uh, again, that, that would be a different podcast. If people are interested, let me know. <laughs> um, but yeah, but, I try to not. Right. Do but you know what is, it's not as if, well, I mean, it also goes in for those for education because you did do that from an educational standpoint, you went and did the mm-hmm. residency residency. You went and got yourself, you know, you you got yourself uh, validated for that. I forget the word I'm looking for. Qualified. I can't think of the word right now. But um, credentialed. Yes, credentialed. That yeah, perfect. Mm-hmm. That's exactly what I was looking for. I got gotcha. you. <laughs> so, but that would be something that I would just think when it comes to that. Now, besides the nutrition part, there's also to talk about what kind of what else do you give as supplements to those pets. So, as I said before, when we started the program, I mentioned that the show that I was working on with first, both companies were CBD related companies, and they provided CBD products for pets. And, you know, some would say it would be for horses, some would say, and they had testimonials, all of them that had, you know, various people that were either veterinarians that were kind of getting themselves into it, but they were not necessarily prescribing it. They were not necessarily going into the level of, they just saw that there were effects that were actually showing positive effects of it. And the same thing goes for, then there's areas about people that are using products that were used necessarily for animals where now we're getting a deal with and psychedelics where ketamine treatment is very prominent now in more states than ever. It's the matter of what's being used, what shouldn't, what should or should not be used for pets or animals or for humans. And then this area of other, you know, I guess would be on the fringe products. Have you had any chance to talk to anyone in that area about what they've done in terms of if they've explored other alternative treatments and what would you say about that? Yeah. You mean on the show? Have I brought on your show? Yes. Yeah. I am to some degree. Yes. Uh, So we have a term that is called like holistic or um, integrative alternative, all of those terms. So we do have veterinary professionals who have been educated in in those aspects of alternative medicine. Um, You may also think of like Eastern medicine. So I have had several people on. In fact, one that I really, really enjoyed having on was an oncologist. So she was trained in the very traditional cancer doctor uh, medicine, but she also at the same time took a lot of alternative educational as well. So she's certified in a lot of those areas as well. So what we love, this is a big focus on veterinary medicine, is being able to be more diversely versed in options because people really care about their pets. 
treatment for medical concerns is getting more and more expensive. So we want to make sure that we are able to provide lots of different options for pet owners so that they know that there's something that they can do in one way or another. So there's a lot of effort on understanding all of those different options for the pet owner to to be able to do something for their pets. So absolutely, I'm starting to see that much more in the veterinary industry. I want to go and talk about you about the equipment. Now, and one of the things you mentioned of when you were talking to us about the show, that you said that <clears throat> your husband is very you know, pronounced uh, when it comes to IT engineering and found you great equipment and got you stuck out of situations. And you study yourself on other podcasts and YouTube. And you also joined the podcasting Minimind mini mastermind inside SPI pro. And you really have put yourself also giving tips about doing podcasting in the pet and vet podcasting spaces. So you mentioned that for yourself, you're a podcast advocate because of the connections podcast builds with guests, but also with listeners. And when you receive a LinkedIn message about how listening has made a difference, that's worth the effort. So when I look at the setup that you have just from the view right now <clears throat> for video, it's well set. And it's also, you know, there's all these podcasting schools and all these different experts that come on. I've done it for 19 years and I'm not going to ever say that I know everything about everything, but you know, there is a thing to be said about you can do it on a significant budget <clears throat> and you can also get it where you can get the equipment where it sounds good. And I think everybody kind of just forgets <clears throat> about how much you need to go and sound good in the first place for podcasting. This is still radio 2.0. Something to be said about doing a radio presentation for you. You're well-spoken. You very little fumble or stumble over words, which is like, you know how hard it is to train other. I have clients every day. I, oh my God, I have a show that I just finished. I, I couldn't finish editing today. 40 minute program. I have to cut it down because I have to cut out every stutter fumbling, uh, you know, just every stammering, all that kind of stuff. And I have to go through right now. I've only gone through 15 minutes of it. And I had to cut about five minutes out just because of everything else. And that's from the host's, and the guests because they're just new to it. And it's one of those things where, you know, for a good podcast, you have to sound good. You have to present yourself well. You have to have, the, I mean, it's for me, it's as simple as, yes, you can have, you know, projection and you can have your voice, just have good sounding voice. But also it's just as simple as speak well, be literate, you know, be, you know, just don't make it so hard for people to go and listen to. So it comes down to the equipment. It comes down to how you speak. Talk to me about the importance of that and what kind of tips you do give to other fellow podcasters from what you've learned. Yes, absolutely. And, and like you were describing, I have become a downright podcast nerd. Um, <laughs> I love this platform and I love talking about it. So yes, I do pretty much everything myself. Where I get the biggest support is my husband, who's an IT engineer. He's also a YouTuber. So he's been through this and he makes sure that I'm equipped with the right microphone. That was my number one is I wanted to make sure I had a good microphone because that is the key to podcasting. Is it's that's great. What people have, is I don't listen. even know which one that is, but it's awesome. Like it it's sounds fantastic. It's a very basic, it's $75. It's not that bad. It's totally worth investing $75 to get a good microphone. So I definitely recommend that to people. I also started doing a video podcast at the same time. I know it was nuts. I don't know <laughs> if I would recommend that to everybody, but I did. And so if you are going to go that route, I would get at least a somewhat decent camera. It does not have to be the $5,000 camera that I have seen some people get, but at least something that people can watch. But even I hear recommendations that honestly, even audio is still better than video, even on YouTube, because if people can't hear you or understand you, they will leave Right. more so than if you look a little blurry. So, <laughs> Well, that's <laughs> a one. distinction because people just realize with video or audio – yeah, we're, we're more or less, and I, I forget what's, uh, it was the headliner podcast I talked about the fact that for those that listen on YouTube, they're listening more than they are watching. It's just, it's in the mm -hmm. background. If we happen to catch you on screen, and listen, we all have learned the same thing where it's there's just a certain format. If you're doing a video podcast, it looks like what Howard Stern's done. Well, he was the beginning. He was the person that pioneered it because everybody else follows that same thing he did on each channel, Joe Rogan's idea, or just others. And it's like, okay, but the, but the most important thing is, 
is that all those video podcasts, they use these type of microphones. They're not using lavaliers. They're going to let a microphone sit in front of them because they want the radio setting. They don't understand. They probably don't know why they do that, but they do. Now, that must be under, a, you must have a sound card under there and some phantom power that also, on that microphone, to get the compression to get the sound of it because that is crystal clear. Oh, I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> I can tell yeah, the difference but... because it, that's, I know that I can almost tell that what, what your husband did, what you both did together to put that together. Plus, even the, the stand you have in there, it's that's that's like heavy duty. It's solid. Yes, the arm is lovely. I also, so again, I've tried lots of different things. When I've, I've started a podcast for where I work, I've tried doing interviews in person. And what I found is we had these microphones and we put it on the table. My guest kept hitting the table during the interview. And so it sounds so loud on the audio right. because it just like resonates into the microphone. And so I, I have definitely tried things that not worked as well. But if probably for a lot of people that have podcasts that do guest interviews, you're not interviewing radio hosts or pod, even podcast hosts. These are just average people that are in the niche that you are addressing like I do, most of the veterinarians that I bring on or vet techs, they aren't professional speakers. They, a lot of them have come and spoken extremely well, but that, you know, these are not professionals right. and a lot of them don't come with the good microphones. I, I know I've heard some people who will send the guest a microphone and I, I'm, I don't know if I have the money or time <laughs> to do that. So also getting some editing equipment that mm -hmm. help you very much in the editing process, even if you have a blender where you forget to turn the right microphone on or something right. like that. There are some backup things that can save it. Uh, I have recently moved to Descript as one of my editing tools. Right. They have some great tools with trying to help with sound quality. Um, I also, for my video aspect, I use Final Cut Pro. It's a little bit easier for me to do the video editing in that. So I have several different softwares that I have at my disposal to try to help if, you know, things are getting hard with the editing. Right. And I do tend to be a heavy editor. I want to make sure that my guests sound good. Right. So, the Descript has been helpful in, in expediting that piece a lot because you edit based on text. So I still have the script up at the bottom so I can right. see the sound waves because there's some things that are still just easier to edit through sound waves. But it helps you kind of find those filler words, all the ums, the – and everybody has a different one. I'm sure you've discovered this too. Oh, my goodness, yeah. <laughs> oh, man. So, I, I, just the worst of it all. The script is not cheap. I know that's also quite an investment to put on that. It's good, but it is a little pricey. I know that part. Yep. I've been doing this now for two years, and – Again, I don't have a lot of help, so it's a lot cheaper for me to get to script than it is right. to hire it out. I mean, I would love to get to the point where I can hire more things out and get a bigger team to help support because with all that time that I could save, not only could I do like things in life, but <laughs> also to really invest more on the marketing and awareness side of the podcast, which is extremely important. For podcasters, really, Agreed. that is going to be part of it if you want to spread awareness. As much as I love podcasting, one of the disadvantages, we don't have a lot of things driving traffic to an audio podcast. There's a few things, but it, it's not a lot. And so it's really helpful to have some type of marketing strategy. I do believe it needs to be targeted, and I can go more into that if you like marketing. Oh, sure. But that is very important, I, I feel, in growing your podcast. Well, and one of the things I did going back to October, and I'll tell you when it comes just to unpack about the script that I had a show that I was producing called Mobile Presence, and we did that for oh my god, ten plus twelve years, I think it was, and mm -hmm. only stopped because sponsorship kind of just dried up. But that's okay. She was great. She used the script, and exactly like you said, for her to go ahead and use the effect of this and just be able to go ahead and clear up everything that was going on, she can go ahead and give us a script back to us, and we can go ahead and clear out everything that was going on because she wanted to make it easy for her, easy for the, everybody else, because she also wanted to transcribe everything. So she also repurposed that to go out there for the guests and for other people. And also maybe it's lead generation to get others. Hey, here's your podcast and video. Here's it on audio. This and that we used Riverside at the time also for the video portion to put it out there. So like all this was being done, which was great. And so many different uh, platforms and things we could be using ourselves. I'll tell you also, when it comes to the audio quality, one of the best things I found last year was the uh, Adobe podcast enhancer. I don't know if you've seen that yet, but let me tell you, I spend $10 a month 
on that for Adobe Express. That's part of the whole package. So you can test your microphone out. The podcast enhancer, I I kid you not, I saw somebody on TikTok talk about it, and you could have somebody that could be on the other side of the room, full echo. If the, the, the voice is loud enough and it's clear enough to hear, you clear out, it just takes away everything. It's AI technology. It just takes away all that background noise. You don't have to do it on your microphone. It's perfect. I wish every podcast had a sound, sound like yours. I don't know what it sounds like on your end, on my end, but you know, even for me, like just to get the right, because I mean, there's nothing in terms of the background noise. I have to work on, like I had to go and change my ceiling fan in here to go ahead and get rid of that because of the noise I was hearing from it. All these different variable factors, but you can do it. And you know, it's also just, it just takes more time just to go and learn more about what you can do to make a better podcast. So to make a mention again, the podcast is titled Vet Life Reimagined. And real quickly, for those that want to go ahead and catch the show, obviously it's in all different places going, uh, that you have podcasts. I know Apple, I see right off the bat, you got ratings and you're doing really well with the show. Uh, what Talk to me about what the initial origin site is and where people can go and find all their content, all your content yeah. in general. Absolutely. So vetlifereimagined.com is kind of home base. It has everything right there on the website, including sponsorship. So I actually do recommend I held out for a long time to build a real website for my podcast. And as soon as I did, I actually had a lot more people find it specifically on the sponsorship side of things. So that was nice. That was a big goal. So what do you know? Website helped with that a lot. So that's my home base. If, if you want to find out the audios, the videos, contact me, all sorts of stuff, that's kind of home base. But yes, I do have a YouTube channel same name, Vet Life Reimagine. The audio, same name. You can find it on all audio platforms. Now, I do want to ask, and it was something I was, we took a little bit of a break only because I wanted to figure out and get my thoughts back together. So you're in the same boat as I am when it comes to getting subscribers on YouTube and trying to get the audience to go ahead and follow along with your show, marketing and growth strategy. So mm. I know for me that I, in October, started using Headliner because I all my podcasts are hosted on Spreaker. And I use the headliner app. Of course, it gives you a little watermark, but still, I can repurpose it on Instagram, Facebook, you, you know, uh, TikTok, and Twitter, among other places. And it has given me a little bit of boost. I can get my subscriber count up a little bit. But it's one of those things where, you know, the only, everybody talks about it with like a certain algorithm about, you know, do you need to be putting out the same kind of content all the time? But as you said yourself, you're not, you probably can see what shows perform better than others. But, you know, in some thoughts, content creators will think, well, we just need to keep creating the same stuff over again, over and over, because we're going to get the same amount of viewers and that'll just keep building our base. But we also have other content we want to talk about that might not be as popular or might be a little bit different off the beaten path. And, but we still think it's important. And if it, you know, means we might take a little bit of a dive on the listener count because, you know, not every episode is going to be exactly, you know, tuned into what they're listening about. But if they're willing to go and explore and learn a little bit more outside of their normal, what they want to go and learn, then give it a chance. Like if you like the show, that's a part of where you want the host to be likable and you want to enjoy what they're talking about. And that you also want to go ahead and follow along with them exploring different areas of the subject of veterinary medicine. Yeah. So YouTube growth strategies, I, some of it is consistency. So it really is just putting out content. Cause I, I have seen my husband has gone through ups and downs mm -hmm. of being consistent mm -hmm. and consistency can really make a difference. It, it takes a while. Also, it really depends on your niche. Mine is not the most clickable, searchable niche, <laughs> right, right. but I do my best. So one of the big things with YouTube is really your title, your thumbnail. And the intro, you really have to hook people. Um, those are some of the big keys. I do love the analytics in YouTube. It gives you a lot of different things to look at. So if you're like me and an analytic nerd <laughs> as well, they can right. be very helpful. But if you are brand new, it does take time to get the analytics in your YouTube as well. Oh, yeah. So it can be really frustrating to start. So I think if you are just starting, a lot of it is being consistent and being a student, I think that's another one. That one never changes. You are always a student. Things are going to change. These are platforms we don't control. While 
it's not a big scary algorithm. There is some to it that, you know, there are right. things that they're going to be focused on that are going to be different. So I think it's important to be a student and ultimately being a student of your audience, who is your target audience? What do they want? Where are they going? Trying to be as keyed into that, I think is also going to be helpful for you because if you're like me in a smaller niche, you don't need a, a million subscribers, that's not necessarily the most important thing to you. But who are those subscribers? The ones that are more true fans, that's really the better target. Now, if you have a big niche, like you're in IT, those can be tech niches can be a little bit bigger. And, and so you might be able to achieve that a little bit better. But I think it's really being a student of the platform and your personal audience and trying not to do too much comparison to others. It's really hard. We're human. We do it. it and it's really hard. But really, I think that's where it comes down to doing what's best for your audience, which in, will in return give you the best on, on what your goals are. So hopefully that's helpful. Again, we could go into deeper, but I think those are some of the top line things around YouTube. Right. It's also where the content goes. If you don't feel like we're whatever content you're going to talk about, if you can parlay it off into another podcast, because for me, I have various areas I want to talk about. I my If you see my, my channel... My dot com, King of Podcasts dot com is it's a spectrum because it's, there's four different programs I have now that I host. <clears throat> it used to only start with one, but it's like, okay, but I'm only gonna stick in this lane, stay in this lane when it comes to this content. One's professional wrestling, one's media, and the other one's in like society, dating culture, this and that. And, you know, it depends on however kind of success I've gotten in any of those shows, what kind of traffic I've gotten. For some, it's like, well, it depends on the time of year. The other ones are just depends on the type of, a type of subjects. But I also know that I don't want to be pigeonholed into one different topic. And I think for me, it's like it's nice to have kind of a radio network. And <clears throat> but the thing is, then the focus is on trying to get all those shows to get some kind of content. And Podcasters Row is the newest one. And this is meant to be a way of growing my podcast network out because I'm hoping, well, if I'm promoting others the cross promotion might work as well. And that was something that <clears throat> where I work at, we've always had that thought of process of like, we need to get others to cross promote with us. We need others to promote themselves, promote us and make it where it's a full circle. Do you get a lot of that where you're, what you're doing with your show in terms of what kind of audience that all these other guests have and, you know, leveraging their audience that they have in their footprint in the, in the internet? Yes. It doesn't necessarily go into every guest that I bring on because I really right. love the diversity. I have some really famous veterinarians that have very large audiences. And then I've had people that most people have never heard of before. Right. And I will say some of the people that I've never heard of before that came on, they blew me away. They were fantastic. So I, I love having that diversity. But to kind of go back to where you said cross promote, and I think we even kind of started with this, I think one of the best ways that you can advertise your own podcast is going on other podcasts, going on especially the podcasts that share audiences. Back to one of the reasons that I love podcasting is it's not as competitive as a lot of other industries because the average person today, this mm -hmm. has actually gone up since I first got this stat, the average podcast listener listens to eight podcasts regularly, right. which means that if they're already a podcaster, they're more likely to be intrigued by you and come listen to yours. So I think the cross promotion aspect of it can go both ways. I, I that's why I like being on podcasts, at least in the veterinary side of things. Right. Uh, but I, I truly just love podcasting, so I love coming on podcasts, 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 podcasts. But anyway, yes, I I think that is very important to be strategic. Yes, it's okay to maybe bring on people that don't have as large of audiences because that also makes your podcast unique. Not as many people have heard those people. So as long as you know that they'll be helpful to your audience, going back to really focusing on what's best for them, I think you'll you'll be very happy with the results and so will your audience. I also noticed, and one more thing, I'm gonna, we're going to wrap things up but and come back and also talk about the site once again. But among the guests you've had on, I also noticed that you do try to keep the interviews to less than an hour. So there's an idea where you do have a kind of a bit of a time frame where you want to just be able to say, okay. And if you want to bring somebody back, you can always invite them back on. But it's one of those things where you're not doing the long winded three, four hour kind of diatribe and just where it's just, 
a very casual conversation. You want to be able to get the most out of those interviews. And obviously when you're editing it down, you know, you're getting just the best of the best. Talking about the importance of what you do in terms of making sure that you put a very succinct podcast out there and for others out there that they don't need to go and necessarily go that maybe what radio does in terms of presentation to keep things within a time frame. I know for me, I don't ever go more than an hour on any of these programs either. And one program, I actually kind of keep it at 30 minutes because I just, I need to be cognizant of, like you said, eight different podcasts. Well, they have to be a certain time limit for you to be able to go in and be able to catch them every week. Yeah, absolutely. As much as I love podcasts, Getting trying to listen to a podcast that is over even an hour and a half is really hard for me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Maybe it's because I just like too many. I like flipping. I like different things. So for me and in, in deciding on the length of my podcast, one, again, it goes back to my audience. I have a, a professional audience. They don't have time to sit down and listen to a two-hour podcast episode. Right. That said, I also don't feel comfortable doing very many 30-minute episodes, too, because I don't always feel like I can get the person's full story out in 30 minutes. So there's this balance of making sure you're getting the goals Mm -hmm. of your podcast as well as respecting your audience and what they need. So basically that philosophy of take as long as you need to, no more, no less, right? right? Finding that balance. And I will say I have maybe one or two episodes that went long, and it's because the guest was just so good. Like, in right. fact, my number one episode right now on audio is over an hour long. It's Andy Warwick. He is just amazing. He's hilarious. And he, he like, you can come and listen that long to him. And But, you know, again, finding that balance, uh, it, I think, is really important when it comes to the length of the podcast. Fantastic. So, uh, Megan Sprinkle, Dr. Megan Sprinkle, veterinarian, host of the Vet Life Reimagined podcast, what is exactly the website where people can go and find everything that goes on with the show itself? Obviously, you can find it on all major podcast portals, but where is necessarily the website, the URL? Yep, VetLifeReimagined.com. Pretty easy. Awesome. And thank you again for being on with us. This has been great, and I really love that you've been able to give us so much insight when it comes to the insight, just behind the scenes. And it's this is the way to break the fourth wall of podcasting. I was, okay, if you want to learn about people, what the behind the scenes work is, yeah, the way to kind of just educate instead of just putting it into the shows, because again, people that do technical difficulties, break the fourth wall inside a podcast, please don't do that. I, I always ask not to do that either. But it's those things where there's so much to learn from this, so much fascination when it comes to doing podcasting. And, and like you said, you know, it's Norman Vincent Peel, right? Find a need and fill it. And that's exactly what you did here for aspiring veterinarians and for veterinary professionals that are like-minded like you that all care about pets. And it's, it's a wonderful thing. And I really do love what you're doing with the show and best of luck. And I hope you get a lot more episodes coming up. Thank you. That's the plan. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. And thank you listeners for again listening to another podcasters road as always one website, everything you need to know, king of podcasts.com. And we'll talk to you next time. 